Hello and welcome to the wonderful world of Innova, <laughs> alive and composing with today's guest in real time, Douglas J. Cuomo. Would you state your name for the record, please? Yes, I am Douglas Cuomo, and I am an Innova artist and composer. Hi, Philip. Guilty as charged. You should have one of those little sort of uh, yes, n- numbers in front of you there. Mm-hmm. And we, we like to ask this of every Innova artist because we're taking a poll about are you a cat, dog, or other kind of pet person? Oh, so interesting. I'm a cat person. I like dogs, but we live in Brooklyn, and the idea of having to walk the dog all the time seems, seems a little oppressive to us. So we have a cat, a hypoallergenic cat. Does it have an interesting name that would reveal some of your creative talents? No. It has an interesting name that was a compromise between my children, my wife, and myself, and the name is Percy. That's rather interesting, because my cat's name was Percy as well. Ah. It was not a result of compromise, but you know, Percy Granger was high up in the scale. That's very nice. Scale. Yes. So we already know that you're a, a kind of a family domestic kind of composer, which is very different from uh, some of your itinerant life on the road. How, how yes. did this all start? What, what's your earliest sound memory? My earliest sound memory? Wow. That's so interesting. Um, I don't know. I mean, the earliest memory I have of making sound was in a sort of trying to make music was playing the trumpet when I was a kid. Um, I'll have to think if I'll have to think about the earliest sound memory and get back to you about that. Okay. And uh, how do you spoil yourself after a, a tiring day at the manuscript paper, or whatever mm-hmm. it is? Uh, how do you get away from it all? Oh, unfortunately, I'm not so. Uh, I'm not so great at spoiling myself these days, partly because of the family business with the two two young boys, eight and ten. So, unfortunately, usually after a busy day of that, then I'm home to the busy day of all that other stuff. So perhaps that's spoiling myself, I don't know, or it's ruining me, or I'm not sure which is better, spoiling or ruining. This might be related, but if you weren't making music a career, what might you have ended up doing? Was it always your passion? And you just... It was always my passion. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe some sort of public interest legal thing or something like that. I haven't given it, I haven't given it a superb amount of thought, but perhaps something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe a music can substitute for the, you know, the public good of the, of the That's nation. That's right. I, yes, perhaps. Um, so we'll get the Desert Island discs out of the way. Uh, were, were there Uh-oh. any like pieces? I, I know this is horrible, isn't it? It is horrible. I hate when people ask these questions because right. I don't have answers. I feel like I need to, to sort of get together some some uh, some list of, of all of the, my favorite composers and my favorite yeah. operas in the Desert Island Disc, so I, I might have to just pass. That in <laughs> itself is an answer, because, you know, you know, some people are very clear about what they are. And, yes. Uh, all right. Um, and we'll get this one out of the way, too. What's your greatest fear? My greatest fear? Well, I, maybe, I'm not sure this is true, but the thing that popped into my head was death by drowning. So perhaps that's it. All right, that's on record now. Yes, exactly. Don't threaten Doug by death by drowning him. Okay, so uh, your, your musical beginnings. Um, mm-hmm. Was there a moment when you witnessed something that really changed your life? Did you walk into a gallery? Did you read a poem? Did you hear a piece of music that thought, hey, I really want to be involved in that? Or There's a couple of things like that. One of them was, as I said, when I was a kid, I think in about third grade, I played the trumpet for two years um, in, in the school I was going to public school in the Bay Area in California, we had a band. You know, so you could pick an instrument if you wanted. And for some reason, I don't know why, you know, kids pick trumpets. Or pick, kids pick instruments for whatever reason, pick trumpet. You know, I kind of liked it. I remember having to practice and fill out a sheet of 20 minutes every day. It was sort of torturous to practice at that, at that age to focus for 20 minutes on something. And then I stopped doing it. And so for a year, I didn't do anything. And then I picked up a, a guitar that my mother, I guess, had played guitar a little bit, kind of folk singery stuff. And she had this old, incredibly beat up, crappy guitar um, in the closet, which I used to have. I don't think I have it anymore. Um, it was literally unplayable. Um, but I was fascinated with it for some reason, in a way that the trumpet never really caught my imagination. So there was something about finding that guitar, and there was an old like, folk song book that said at the beginning how to tune the guitar. And it was months of like, trying to figure out how to tune the thing. Of course, it was so wildly out of tune. Um, and then I began to take lessons, and there was something about the guitar that just really drew me into it. Not just the, even the kind of music I was playing, this kind of finger-picky, folky, blues stuff at first. Um, there was that, but just some of the physical act of it, and it was really quite, quite something. Um, 
And then later on, I remember when I was in college, a couple of things uh, that were that really kind of turned on light bulbs for me. And one of them was seeing uh, the Bunuel film, uh, Chien Andalou, the Andalusian dog, um, which is a surreal, surrealistic movie, short movie. Um, and not understanding it in any way because it's not something that's sort of narrative, is an understandable narrative. And even though I, I was, you know, a well-educated high school student, if I had never really come across something like this. And so to realize, like, oh, art could be something that has some meaning beyond just what's on the surface. It was sort of like a, like a thunderbolt for me to understand. And then also at the time I was going to Wesleyan University. Well, actually, I saw that in high school, my last year of high school. And then I went to Wesleyan University in Connecticut, where they have a big ethnomusicology program. And they also have Alvin, Lu Alvin Lussier was there, and I believe still is. Um, and I took a class with Lussier, and he is not, even though he's been teaching now for a very, very long time, he's certainly not an academic, and he's not, he's more of an artist teacher than a teacher artist. So his class was totally over my head. I didn't understand a single thing that he was talking about. Um, and we had to do a project at the end, and I realized I have no idea, like, what... I mean, I couldn't have been more at sea, um, and I did some horrible thing, whatever it was. Um, still totally at sea. But somehow that experience was very... transformative for me, or in the sense that it opened up this possibility. And I thought, oh, there's this whole thing that art can be and music can be that is kind of an unknowable, was unknown, unknown to me. And even once you sort of know it, it is still some real unknowable element. So I had, to, it had this giant influence on me, even though I didn't understand anything that he was talking about. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you teach right now or, or have, have been a teacher, but is that something you would pass on to your, your students? Would, yeah, it is. I don't, I don't teach in a, in a school. I've done, you know, I've gone and given talks and stuff. Um, although Sadly, most for, for me, sadly, is that most of the time people just want to ask the very sort of concrete business-related questions rather than musical ones. But I do, I talk about that idea a little bit of, of these kind of flashes of insight, you know, that you need to have all of the other education to be able to have them land and, you know, the seeds be sown and grow into something. But you do have these kind of flashes of, of moments where things kind of open up, you know, the possibilities open up and you want to always be alert to those moments and, and, you know, notice them when they happen. So somewhere in this school period, was there like your first composition that you would actually acknowledge as something Yeah, proud actually, of? when I was in high school, um, I played guitar. I wanted to be a guitarist. Um, I can, you know, as I talked about loving guitar from the beginning. Um, and I decided I wanted to be a jazz guitar player. And I wrote a song for this little jazz ensemble in high school. Um, and it was the first thing I wrote. It was dedicated to my girlfriend at the time. Um, although I think I was too shy to actually tell her that. Um, and it was, I was thinking about some sort of Mingus music at the time, and it was, it was interesting because I could tell that it, was, that it was good, that there was something about it. And I've actually, the piece, got, the piece got played many years later. I made a recording of it for Homicide when I was writing music for that, and he did some kind of background music. I thought, this is this thing I wrote when I was 16 or something. Um, but there was some moment when I kind of realized, oh, I could, I can kind of do this, and I just, it was, it was interesting um, to know that, and I was still m much more focused on being a player. Um, but through college, I wrote, I still wrote sort of you know jazz tunes essentially, and I wrote a bunch of stuff for my thesis, and one some of that music I still play um, when, on the occasions when I do play guitar. Um, but somehow, it, it's not that it just sort of flowed out of me in some un, uninterrupted thing, but I kind of had some, I had a sense that I could make, that I had a way of thinking about how I wanted things to be and that I could kind of craft these things. It was very, it was, uh, it was an interesting feeling. With guitar playing, I felt like I was, you know, perfectly competent, but I didn't quite have that same something about it. And eventually, you know, I played guitar as a jazz guitarist, for, and I played in funk bands and rock bands and all that stuff. And, you know, a couple of years after college, even. And then I stopped playing guitar. Um, I, didn't, I didn't end up liking it as much as I hoped, and I was touring a little bit as a sort of side man. And, you know, the touring's not necessarily that fun, um, at least on the level I was doing it. Um, and it's because I wasn't enjoying the time on stage enough to make up for the other 
you know, 22 hours in the day. Um, so I, I, I put that aside and began to focus on, on composing. Do you think being primarily familiar with the guitar and the, and the fingerboard and the, and the way the notes are laid out is different from those people who learned the piano and the linear kind of keyboard from low to high? Do you think that colored probably, your subsequent It probably did. Um, I mean, I, I don't write on the guitar at all. Um, I write on the piano and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, a functional piano player at best. Um, I, mean, I understand how it works, but the actual you know, doing things in real time is a, is a challenge for me. Um, but I don't write on the guitar because I'm, because I, things just, I can play stuff on the guitar without even thinking about anything. And it's, you know, so my hand kind of has some automatic way of doing things. And on the piano, there's much less automaticness going on. So it makes me think about things more and sort of hear things more. So I don't, I don't write anything uh, on the piano that's just sort of out of habit at all. And I'm sure that, that, that thinking about, you know, harmonic things on the guitar have some influence. I mean, everything you, everything you do has some influence on you, certainly. When I listen to your music, I think of the, the kind of big, big listening ears that you have. The openness to soundscapes, to environments, to mm -hmm. places, uh, as well as the very kind of expressive and delicate range of kind of styles and things going on there. Uh, whether that's only breath, which you can describe in a moment, a cello piece, um, or Arjuna's Dilemma, mm -hmm. your, your Inverse CD, it's like, I, I can see where maybe an openness at Wesleyan to, to hearing the world music yeah. around you was a natural fit. I don't know if that you mm -hmm. make that connection yourself. No, I absolutely make that connection, but I think that um, this openness to different styles and different cultures of music and also playing lots of different, you know, kinds of... Uh, you know, kinds of music, and I mean, one of the things I did learn of my my undergraduate education, I didn't didn't go to graduate school. My undergraduate education was learning how to play the guitar, basically, um, and taking all sorts of these basic music courses. But I did have a very very good teacher at the University of Miami, this guy Randall Dallahan, who's now retired. Um, and one of the things I really learned was the which served me the best, in a sense of everything I learned, was how to rigorously approach things and learn like how to learn a, a, a piece, how to play a piece, and, and that translated into how to learn about different kinds of music in a sense. And I studied privately, you know, orchestration and composition a bit, um, but a lot of it was what I kind of figured out on my own. Um, and uh, certainly, <clears throat> excuse me, certainly in, uh, in Only Breath, which is a piece I wrote for Maya Beiser, which is on her Provenance CD, which is on in of a... Um, a wonderful CD full of great music. Um, it's based on a roomy poem, although there's no text, and it's for solo cello and some electronics. So there's a certain amount of, it begins with a section with just uh, Maya playing these beautiful melodies. Um, and then this, uh, this section where she plays phrases that then get looped um, in a uh, in an irregular way to make this kind of tapestry of cello sounds and she improvises a little bit over that and ends with a bit of a, of a cadenza. Um, and certainly the, the thinking about that when I was writing the piece was thinking about uh, the sound of, of the call to prayer coming from minarets when I was in, in Turkey at one point, um, staying in a, in a little town near Izmir. Um, the day we arrived, uh, you know, it was up very, very early in the morning because of jet lag, as you know, and uh, you could see the sun beginning to come up on the hills out the window, and, and you could, I could hear the call to prayer coming from these different minarets around the place, sort of all at you know once, and it had this great uh, sense of this tapestry being woven together. So it was that kind of you know being aware of of uh, you know environmental sounds and sort of translating them into some some compositional thing. Which came first, your film and TV work or your composition? Did, did one lead to the other? It's well, I was doing, I was writing music for theater for very, very downtown, like off, 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 off Broadway downtown music, uh, downtown theater. Um, but I was also trying very hard to find a way to make a living writing music or make a living in music at all. I worked as a recording engineer for a while. Um, and uh, I did a bunch of sound design for theater as well. Um, but I ended up doing some documentary films 
uh, some short ones for National Geographic and things through people who I knew, you know, sort of friends of mine who were doing these things. Um, and uh, and that, that sort of took off more quickly, the television stuff and then some film business as well. Um, and that was a way to really make a living at music. And during all that time I was very interested in doing concert music and also writing uh, pieces like Arjuna's Dilemma was sort of for the, for the stage. Um, you know, music driven pieces, but pieces that are on the stage. What I, you know, when I first came to New York, I saw, and I've continued always to see a lot of, uh, a lot of things at BAM at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And that was, you know, I remember also it was another kind of seminal event, which we were talking about before, seeing the first, the first thing that I saw there um, was, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of which one it was that made me really think about this. Um, but at any rate, it was something that made me think, oh, this is what I, this is what I really want to do. Like, I can do this. Even though at the time, I don't think I really had the tools to do it. I had the sense that somehow there was something that was a good fit for me to be able to do. Um, so as I was doing, you know, at some point with the film and television, I, I began to get less excited about doing it and less interested in, in doing it and started to think about trying to really return to doing work that had a real meaning for me. So what was the impetus of Arjuna's Dilemma and uh, how did you approach that musically and, and uh, in terms of visual and, uh, because you're also have just written another opera, Doubt. Yes. And I wonder if there's a connection between them both, uh, are, are they kind of psychological tableaus or are they linear narratives? Or? Yes, it's interesting. Arjuna's Dilemma, which has been recorded and is on the Innova, um, that was a piece when when I was making that transition and deciding I was doing this film and TV stuff, which I was, as I say, enjoying less and less um, for many reasons, um, I really wanted to do something that I felt was my, you know, my music and something that I, that I could feel uh, a deep sort of artistic and psychological and, and in a sense, sort of spiritual connection to. Um, and I'd wanted to write a piece for Amit Chatterjee, a, a singer who I knew, an Indian singer, who's a fabulous singer and guitarist as well. Um, and we talked about various things, and I had no idea if it was going to be a big thing or just a little piece, um, and ended up settling on the uh, to find, we talked about various things in terms of what the piece could be like, what text might be like, and we and ended up settling on the Bhagavad Gita, and once I realized that and thought about it, I knew that it could be some big piece. So I just was determined to do it the way that I wanted to do it. Um, and I wrote uh, first like 12 minutes of it or something like that and made a demo, a very nice sounding demo, um, and took it to Diane Wandas for the producer at Music Theatre Group, because I'd always I'd seen this as something that would be staged. Um, and uh, it was one of those things where it took a long time to actually get the meeting to happen, because when you're trying to meet with people who are very busy, who don't necessarily know you much from before, it can, as, as I'm sure everyone looking at this video probably has, has gone through. Um, but then when we actually met, she said, oh, I listened to this thing and I want to produce it, like right away, which was just, you know, an amazingly wonderful uh, thing, because I was thinking of, you know, that it might be just the beginning of this trail of going around to various different people. Um, so then she said, but of course, first you have to finish writing it, so then I went and, and did that. Um, and then over a long period of time, we workshopped it and all that, and it was premiered in 2008. Um, and that piece, uh, which is based on the story of the Bhagavad Gita, is setting text from the Gita itself, some in English for the chorus, and some in Sanskrit for Tony Bhutte, the, the tenor who's singing the role of Arjuna. Um, and the process of working with the libretto for that was that I would take, I, I simply uh, chose what verses I wanted to set. Um, so I wasn't collaborating with anybody. And, uh, and, it's, and it is a, it's a more uh, contemplative kind of psychological piece. It's not a, there is a story to it, but it's not really, the piece is not narratively driven. And Doubt, the opera that, I'm, that just premiered uh, two days ago uh, here in Minneapolis at uh, Minnesota Opera, um, is very different. I'm collaborating with, uh, with the playwright and, and uh, screenplay writer John Patrick Chan. It's his, it's his original work. Um, and it's a very narratively driven thing. So there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of different demands um, made on the music than there are on the other. 
So uh, in some ways it's a continuation, but it's also a big sort of branching out. Well, you've got an amazing number of strings to your musical bows, and we love your work and keep up the wonderful music. And thanks for talking with us today. Great, Phil. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure.